Welcome to the Power 365 show. Today we've got Michael Vock. I think that's how you pronounce his name, but hey, I don't come from his part of the world, so I've actually got him to say in the show the correct pronunciation of his name. Anyhow, he's he's a brilliant young guy that's just, you know, so switched on when it comes to Power Virtual Agents. Um, I was glad I was able to connect with him, get him on the show of this new product. You know, I've had a play with it. It is amazing at how quickly you can set your bot up and and get it online. You know, I embedded it into my website, uh, WordPress website, in no time at all. Um, after, you know, publishing it to their demo environment, I was able to get it into production. Um, and, and so if you haven't had a, you know, a chance to work with it or you think it's a good fit for your business, go and take a look in the show notes. We'll put all the various links to the resources, to how you can get signed up and, and get using it today. And of course, they'll be found at nz365guy.com forward slash 166. Anyhow, let's get on with the show. Michael, welcome to the Power 365 show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, I can see you've got a fancy last name and uh, I, I don't want to get it wrong. So, so what's your full name? So it's Michael Vakoc. There is supposed to be like a little accent on the end, on the C. Ah, what country is that from? Uh, Czech Republic. Czech Republic. So how long have you been living in the US? Almost two years now, yeah. Wow, I've, wow. I've moved wow. Uh, with Microsoft. So I worked for Microsoft in Prague and then I moved here. So, yeah, so interesting to say that Microsoft in Prague has got quite a big office, right? That's true. Yeah, so there is a, there's a development center. Uh, we actually also have some Dynamics. Uh, for marketing there. There are some folks Correct. developing that. Uh, Martin Costal, he's, he's, he's leading the development center there. And then there is a huge presence for Skype and Teams. Wow. So there is okay. three products, substantial presence. I, I heard the team for uh, marketing was around over 300 engineers there or something. That sounds about right, yeah. It's, yeah, yeah. And, and the same numbers would be for you know combined Skype and Teams. Uh, yeah. So it's a pretty substantial office. Yeah, that's incredible. So so just tell me, you know, I love Prague. Um, I haven't been there much, but I have visited and love the city, love the culture, love the heritage, architecture, all those type of things. What are your favorite things around Prague? I think it's, uh, you know, and especially now when I come back to visit, uh, I come to appreciate it even more and more just to like go through downtown and enjoy you know, the vibe of the city. Uh, and it, it's very, you know, you can just feel the history of what what has been going on there. And I have came to appreciate it more and more uh, because I grew up in Prague, so I didn't, you know, necessarily appreciate it as, a, as when I was younger. Uh, but I think now it's just amazing to see that. And of course, you know, the beer, uh, you appreciate the beer too. Yeah, yeah. I did a full food tour while I was there and we, they took us to a big beer hall was part of that. It's actually started our food tour, which was Man, it was amazing. And I think, is it Hemingway? Have you ever been to that bar Hemingway's? In, in oh, of Prague? course. Man, that's, yeah. that one is good, yeah. It's pretty uh, yeah. hard to get to. I yeah, yeah. Really we, not, yeah. I arrived in from London and probably landed at about 11 o'clock at night, and the first thing I did was went to Hemingway's because it's just its reputation, you know? <laughs> that's right. That's good, cool, man. <laughs> it was good, man. Um, so tell me, um, what brought you from Prague to the United States? Yeah, so as I said, I worked for Skype there uh, for about two years. I actually, I did my internship uh, back in the days. So when I was still in Prague in college, uh, there was an internship opportunity at Skype. So I did an internship there. And then after school, I started full time. I worked there about two years. And then there was an opportunity to work on Teams in Redmond. Uh, so I, that's what brought me in. Uh, actually, the Teams opportunity. I worked for Teams for Education. So what we did is we, uh, you know, integration with learning management systems like Canvas and so on, uh, and how to bring that to Teams. Uh, so that was really the, the trigger. Very cool, very cool. And did uh, have you left all your family back in Prague, or do you have family over with you, or what? So my my parents and my brothers, they are all still back in Prague. Uh, but uh, yeah, so so I love them there. We we still meet up pretty often. We just went to New York for a nice family trip, so it was it was cool. Uh, and now I live in in Seattle with my wife. Uh, so it's, yeah. And um, just to get a bit personal, is your wife American or is she uh, from the Czech Republic as well? 
She's neither. She she's from India. Oh, wow. Okay, okay. And did you meet her at Microsoft? I did. Yes, she works in a different team. Yeah. I love it. So cool. So cool. I didn't realize that you, you know had a background in teams, um, and so I'm just going to ask you a little uh, a digression question there. And if you don't know it, like that's fair enough because you might not. But you know, at the moment, um, if you want to use uh, Dynamics 365 in Teams, you can do that, but you can't use native CDS, can you? Just yet in Teams, is that right? As in from a um, booting an app directly into it? So yeah, I don't know that. <laughs> I, yeah, yeah, I actually yeah. haven't tried it yet, uh, so I, I wouldn't know. It came up in a conversation today, and so when you mentioned Teams, I thought I'd just I'd just riff and see if see if you did anyhow. But you know, I would say if if it's not supported yet, uh, Teams is a you know super big growth opportunity for for everyone. So I'm I'm pretty sure uh, there is someone thinking about how to support the full experience so that there is no limitations. Yeah. yeah, exactly, exactly. So how did you transition from Teams into Power Virtual Agents? Yeah, that's a that's a that's a good question. So um, I actually worked with um, someone who you know then transitioned into Power Virtual Agents who was also working on Teams. Uh, and he was building his team in Power Virtual Agents. And so then he reached out to, to me with an opportunity. Uh, so I joined his team uh, about earlier this year. It was before Power Virtual Agents went to public preview, which happened in June. Uh, and actually we went, I don't know if uh, listeners, I think there might be some confusion, right? Because we went to public preview as Dynamics uh, 365 virtual agent for customer service. But in Ignite, which happened around a month ago uh, in, in November, uh, we announced the rebranding to Power Virtual Agents and becoming part of Power Virtual uh, Power Platform. Um, so yeah. So so yeah, that totally makes sense. And product names change, right? As things evolve and and nomenclatures like the word Power is has been rolled out. We saw it with Power Automate changing at the same time. So so not unusual. But one of the subtleties of that change was it was formally targeted in that um, phase as a customer service thing, but now it's actually available directly to CDS, right? So anybody can use it as part of apps that they build. That's right. Yeah, so basically the reason why it started off a bit like a customer service solution was because we, you know, it's easier to focus on one uh, specific area to prove a concept. Uh, we did it very successfully uh, with, you know, our public preview. Uh, feedback that we heard back and so it was very clear from the beginning but the vision was always that this is going to be useful beyond customer service uh, so we started off there uh, but that's definitely not where we wanted to end long term so this was always a vision to evolve it into a into a platform play uh, so that you can use it for any uh, sort of chatbots uh, that you could use in your applications mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Did you ever, I don't know if you would have come across it based on, on your time at Microsoft, but a product Microsoft purchased some years ago called Parature. Are you familiar with that? No, I haven't heard of one. Okay, okay. It, it had this this kind of, a lot of IP that made up customer service around particularly the knowledge base and 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 uh, handling cases, the way they're handled now came from, it was IP that was acquired from that product. And they had a kind of a... Um, it wasn't a um, a virtual agent. It was a live agent type um, configuration in that environment. Gotcha. So it would be, it would be more similar maybe to to Dynamics uh, three sixty five Omnichannel Hub. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I I I, I, I want to drill into that. Just as the you know I've I've hit that point in my virtual agent that I've set up called cool. uh, NZ Bot Guy. Um, I wanted to change the name of it, but it won't let me change the name of it, will it? I have to start a new That's bot, true. is that right? We, 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 we will bring this feature at some point. We, we know about this. We, there's a lot of people complaining that they are not able to, to <laughs> rename the bot. I have a mate and, uh, you know, in, the, in the same industry that we're in, and anytime something gets boring, he goes, listen, I don't see any dragons in it, so like I'm switching off, you know, it's bored. And so I was like, yeah, I want to rename mine to, you know, the NZ uh, Dragon Bot or something like that, just to make I it a bit see. more lively. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, sense. we don't address. We got. What's your role in Power Virtual Agents? What What's your involvement? Yes. Yeah, so as I said, I'm in one of the two product teams. Uh, so we basically have two main product teams or two product teams which which build this. Uh, we kind of 
try to uh, the way how we are structured is we think about you know the personas that use the product. So one team is really focused on the people who create the content and alter the the content itself, and then there is another persona which is you know the person who who manages the bot itself and and multiple bots and uh, who kind of does the more of a bot manager role uh, as well as admin uh, kind of experiences. So I work on the admin team and then bot manager team. And personally, I worked on the, the licensing and the onboarding for that system. So so the, the SKU or the you know the actual product that we shipped on 12.2 when we had the GA. Uh, yeah, so I, I shipped that SKU for that people can actually purchase it. Wow. Okay. Okay. And so this is the thousand dollar for two thousand engagements or something, is it? That's correct. Yeah. So it's uh, two thousand uh, sessions, uh, build sessions, what we call. And the the way you think of it, it's basically the way we designed it. It's it's the entire interaction that on average you will have with a bot. So it's it's as long as you talk with the bot. You know, it doesn't matter how many topics, how many intents you you would talk about. Uh, it's the one unit. Yeah, so it's kind of like active sessions, right? Once you once you kill that, you know, fill out the survey at the end type thing, that would consider the termination of that chat, right? Uh, depends on how you build the bot, but even if you, because for example, the default, uh, like the way how we saw some people build it, is that put a survey under after each topic. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So if you have that, uh, but you hit multiple topics in that one session, it would still be considered as one session. So it's more of a time-based uh, kind of unit. So we have two limits. One is time and one is turns, which are more of a like a, you know, it's like a prevention kind of system. It's not really what we expect from data that we saw people to hit. So just think of it as one conversation with the bot. That's kind of what I tell people, yeah. Yeah. So so just tell me, what do you mean by turns? So turns is uh, what we call, uh, and I apologize for the nomenclature, right? You know, that's all right. We are so deep every day, and it's yeah, 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 yeah. You know, I just assume people know. Uh, it's basically one interaction with the bot. So one, think of it, one turn in our conversation, right? I ask you, ask me a question, I respond. That would be one turn. Right, and so do you have kind of like based on your data is telling you an average uh, bot interaction would have X number of turns. Yeah, we do have that, yeah. Yeah, um, that makes sense, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay, okay, so so now you're responsible on the bot admin slash manager side, therefore, do, so, and then the other team is responsible for the person, are you talking about branching the stream as well as creating the, you know, the kind of knowledge base articles that, that potentially you've been interactive with? Or is the bot admin somebody that would basically model out the entire conversation path based on um, uh, triggers? Yeah, so it really depends. We, we see all kinds of approaches that people take to designing their bots, right? And I think we get a bit to, to the personas that, that create a bot. So what we have seen with uh, some companies that we have worked in the past, uh, big companies that have used kind of sort of version one of this product, uh, which which was very similar to to this uh, Power Virtual Agents implementation, is there is designers, content designers that actually you know go and develop that uh, uh, content itself on a, on a high level structure, and then there is subject matter experts who go and actually fill in the the details because they know it the best, right? Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah. Okay, so so that makes sense to me. So. Just, just so I'm clear, the bot admin manager experience, would they take what those teams, what the subject matter expert had written out and the content designer had done, and would they then actually drop it into the application? Exactly. Yeah, so gotcha. we have a, okay. you, can, you can deploy it, you know, we have multiple channels. Uh, I think it's north of 10, actually. We support the same channels as bot framework because we are built, built, built on bot framework. Uh, so we support web chat. You can just put it on your web. You can put it into Teams. You can put it into Facebook Messenger um, and many other channels where you can just deploy the bot. Yeah, when uh, when I deployed my bot the other day, I was impressed at how many channels were already loaded that you could drop it, you know, drop it into. And, yeah. uh, you know, I lit it up against WordPress. 
I want to see it. It's actually still live on my blog now, and a few people have gone interacted with it. Um, awesome. it, it doesn't do much, but it was just for me, you know, to, giving it a, a, you know, an education lesson to myself on it. I just found it so easy and smooth to use, you know. It, um, and I was, I was impressed by the number of out of the box channels that were available. Do you have a uh, an appetite to grow those number of channels, or should I say, grow the sophistication around how those channels will be supported? And uh, and I'm talking about the publishing channels, right? Not the uh, ingestion channels. Correct. Yeah. So so we definitely are looking into both. We are looking into how to make it even simpler so that you can publish it on Teams or, or Messenger super quickly. Uh, at the same time, we are looking at more channels, uh, like native support for SMS. Uh, that's something that uh, we would like to bring at some point. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, nah, very cool, very cool. So, so for those in our audience that are listening, can you explain what Power Virgil Agents is? Yeah, totally. So, first of all, I think I would, I would, uh, you know, let everyone know that we are publicly available now. So you can just go on our website and you can sign up. Anyone can sign up for a trial uh, and they can try it yourself. So it's best to you know see for yourself. You can just go to ak.ms slash try PVA. Uh, but to to explain what it is, right? So if I if I start from uh, the user benefits and how we how we think about the, the end users. So think of it as a as a no way, no no code way of how to build chatbots. Uh, nice. And so you don't need any code as you have experienced for for sure when you when you are building your bot. And as you said, it's super easy to to do so. Uh, without any hard setup, that, and that was always our goal. Uh, but the the beauty that we see in that is that not only you can build a chatbot uh, which answers your questions, uh, but thanks to the integration with Power Platform, it can also take action on your behalf. Right. And so, so because we use uh, we collaborated very closely with Power Automate, you can call anything from Power Automate uh, to kind of. Any connectors that they have already built, uh, you can invoke it uh, from the conversation. So any CDS interaction, uh, Azure DevOps, uh, you name it, uh, all that is possible using the, the chatbot and using conversational AI uh, to do so. Mm. Wow, wow. So, so that's very interesting. One step back from that, tell me about the... The expectation, if you like, from the customer nowadays when interacting with a business, let's say they've got a website or something like that, you know, in the past, the minimum of a business website would have would be a contact us form. And and often that doesn't cut it anymore, right? People want their questions are answered right now while they're on your digital assets in some form. So Michael, tell me about what the interest is from a customer perspective. Like I, you would have done your research as into what customers are demanding in the market and what are you seeing? Yes, yeah, so I think what we are seeing is, uh, is a shift in general from you know having a website uh, where you can find information yourself if you dig really deep. Uh, but as, as more and more information is um, just available out there it's really hard sometimes to navigate uh, the websites right and get all the information so what we see is that on specific use cases a conversational interface is much more efficient to go to where you need to to get right so so if you if you imagine you have a company right which has a which has a website and there is hundreds thousands of actions that you can which you can do on the website right so instead of you having to go and navigate where you want to actually go and find an action you can just talk to a to a to a bot and say exactly what you want to do and that bot is going to do that search for you and not it's just going to surface you the content but it's going to also take the action and that's the second important thing that we see from the customer that we that they demand and that is again the goes back to the integration with Power Automate, and that is to the bot needs to take an action on what the customer is asking because uh, it's not very helpful if you just answer a question. It you know if you if you answer a question about returns, people people are not interested hearing this is the return policy. Go click here and, and do that right. 
uh, they're interested in actually completing that return inside of that conversation and, and finishing up that uh, session. So, so when I first saw the bot framework, it was some years ago, you know, um, uh, Satya actually had somebody come up on stage in New Orleans, I was at the time, demoing um, the bot framework, and it was around a pizza ordering scenario. Are these virtual agents something like that, that you could actually place an order with, or are they more information virtual agents that are designed to give you access or get access to the right information as quickly as possible, rather than becoming a full kind of like commerce enabled experience? No, you could totally do that. I mean, you could, thanks to Power Automate, uh, you can take, so, so, as I said, right, with the, the refund, let's let's stay in that example. Uh, it's easy to just, you know, authenticate the user. We have, uh, we support customer authentication, so the user can authenticate into the canvas, into the chat canvas. So you know the identity of the person. Uh, once you know the identity of the person, you can fill in their, you can get their order history. You can see what they ordered. Uh, and then you can ask which of the items that they recently ordered they want mm -hmm, to return. Mm -hmm. Wow, and okay, that's cool. So it's as simple as that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So tell us a bit more about the relationship between Power Virtual Agents and Power Automate. Yeah, so the relationship, think of it as, uh, you know, two tools that, that work very closely together. Uh, or one and But you really, if you're the end user, you think you are interacting just with the bot. Uh, you don't really know that there is Power Automate in the background, who the bot author, uh, who was able to use it to take the action. So what that means is if you design a dialogue uh, in Power Virtual Agents, uh, you have these nodes, what we call nodes. And one of the nodes, uh, for example, is a question, right? So just a question and an answer. But one of them also can be a trigger to Power Automate. So what it does is you, you trigger a Either you build a new Power Automate flow uh, that you want to use, or you just go in there and you uh, build a new one uh, for that particular need. And uh, there is a native integration that uh, just makes it super easy to call Power Automate, um, where you can already leverage the, I think, over 270 existing connectors uh, to access your data. Uh, access the data in CDS or any other system uh, that you have used. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so tell me about the CDS story then, because as as we discussed before, the dependency for Dynamics three six five was removed, right? So now apps can be built directly on to any uh, CDS instance. Is that right? That's absolutely right. Yeah. So when to to build a Power Virtual Agent, you actually need a CDS environment. Uh, because we store the bot uh, in a CDS, uh, which will come handy later on when you can when you want to package it as a solution and and, and so on and just move it around. Uh, and so, given that you already have a CDS, you can you can build a bot in that CDS. Uh, you can access data in that uh, CDS environment, and so any customer data that you have there. Uh, you can you know either edit, um, you can insert, you can uh, delete, etc. Mm -mm -mm. So 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 what you just said there, are you saying, or just correct me if I'm wrong, but it's fully solution aware. So these can be packaged and solution and run through an ALM process. So th this is our vision. Uh, I think at this point in time, it's not yet uh, fully solution aware, uh, gotcha. but yep, it, it's yep, certainly yep. Uh, something that customers are asking for, and and we hear that because yeah, uh, yeah. it's just a, such a big part of the ecosystem solutions. So that's really something we are working on. So tell me about the supportability for the finished apps in Dynamics three six five. Do will you release kind of like? Um, that if like let's say you did have customer service and you're using the knowledge base and customer service will you release kind of a version or a templated version of the power virtual agent specifically for that or will it automatically connect um just as another data source and and the the individual or company would need to stitch up um the relationship between the knowledge base in uh customer service dynamics 365 customer service so we are always looking into how to integrate with other products at Microsoft. And this is a very interesting scenario that you that you mentioned there. 
it would be possible to, to achieve this uh, through some integrations if you wanted to. Uh, but we, you know, there's there's so many things to do <laughs> that we could yeah, do. That, yeah. uh, we, we really try to to go after the, the most common common scenarios. So one example of, you know, similar, I think, case, what, what you can do actually with the bot uh, today is you can point just the bot to an uh, existing FAQ page that you have. And the bot will automatically parse that page. It will extract all the information and all the questions. Uh, and it, then people can interact with that content as a bot. And you don't have to do really much. Wow, that's up. very cool. That's very cool. OK, I didn't realize uh, I haven't got that far with it. One of the other things, that just understanding those people working with the bot, um, you've talked about two personas, one, one persona being the admin or manager of a, a, a bot or multiple bots. And then you've talked about the content creator um, and subject matter experts um, that would add the content to how, you know, for the bot to interact with. Any other personas involved in your mind? Yeah, I, I would get, I would step, take a step back here, right? And I, I think what we, what we saw in the past, uh, when we did some deployments in with with customers, with big customers, uh, is when you want to build a bot, and that was before Power Virtual Agents, right? It was uh, a standard uh, bot building tools. Is you would need uh, you know developers, you would need designers, you would need data scientists, you would need subject matter experts, uh, in order to really build a bot, right? And the person who was kind of what who we realized or who the team realized before even I was part of the team was that the subject matter experts are really the people who know uh, the content the most and are the ones who need to um, be able to and who want to be able to update their content, right? So in the past, what happened was you had to, if you were a subject matter expert and you wanted to update your bot, uh, you had to go and give a item to a backlog, into a developer's backlog, right, who were supporting not just your bot, but probably 20 other applications in a, in a company. And it took a long time before they got into this uh, for your to your item and were able to update it, right? So if you had a, a crunch before Christmas, uh, like it's now, you know, relevant, uh, you would have to go and, and persuade them to really update whatever you needed in a, in a topic. Uh, but now what the power is that really as we kind of focused on these subject matter experts and the citizen developers, as, as the term is used in Power uh, Power Platform, is they can do it themselves and they can do it in a matter of minutes, right? Uh, they don't need... We also provide one one thing that I didn't mention yet is we provide built-in analytics. So right. Yes. Exactly. Actually, you you have you have deployed your bot, right? Yeah. So, yeah. I saw I saw Power BI is built in and, and it lit up straight away. And then the more interactions, I noticed that all came to life very quickly. Exactly. So now you can see how many how ex exactly how many people have interacted with the bot. You can see what they were asking about, and you we also provide metrics on how well they are satisfied with these. Yeah. Exactly. Things that you provided, right? So, so through the service that we have some built in, uh, you can see which topic is doing the, the best and which topic is perhaps people are not very satisfied with. And that really empowers the subject matter experts to do the job of all these other people. And basically, they don't need uh, the whole team and rely on a, on a you know data scientist to, to create a data dashboard and pull data. To do all that, uh, you can do it yourself. Well, one of the the things that Paracher had in it was this concept um, of of case deflection. So, for example, the bot gets the correct answer, so therefore there wasn't a need for somebody to interact with a call center, or support desk, or something like that. Are you measuring case deflection, or you know, or having some metric around? that the, you know, if this wasn't resolved here, it would have gone to a support call? Yeah, yeah, and we, we do actually, uh, so just, we do have a, we call it escalation rate. Uh, we don't call it deflection, but what basically is you can escalate it to a human agent. Uh, we also have, we also, the other outcomes that we measure uh, is a resolution rate, right? Which of course is a metric that you wanna, you wanna optimize for that because that means 
your bot was able to resolve people's questions and you didn't have to engage any human. And then we also have a metric for abandoned uh, rate. So that tells you how many people just weren't very satisfied probably with the topic or didn't get the right help. And so they just left. And so just coming back to this escalate topic, this is a, a very interesting, I, I think, point, uh, which we didn't talk yet about. And that is you can build a bot, uh, which, you know, has 20 topics, uh, but there is still something which you might not be able to fully automate, or you might not want to fully automate. Uh, in that case, there is a simple configuration uh, that you can do uh, currently with Dynamics Omnichannel, uh, Dynamics Omnichannel Hub, and you can transfer that uh, directly to a live agent. And that live agent, they will see the full history of what the person was chatting with the bot, right? So I just recently had a very uh, bad experience. I, I It was with one retailer. Uh, I chatted with their support and I chatted with a bot first, right? But I wasn't able to get to my answer. And then I was deflected to a human being. And I was like, okay. And the human d didn't know what I didn't wanted to do. Didn't have the history. Yeah, they, they were mm -hmm. like, oh, mm -hmm. what is your problem? I was like, okay, I just mm -hmm. spent five minutes talking with yes, the bot, yes. right? Yes, yes. So that's what we are trying to kind of uh, help and improve. Yeah, because something like that can create so much frustration for a customer when they're just like, I've just explained that to your organization. Yes, it might have been a bot. And now you're asking me to do it again. Like, it's yeah. very frustrating. And it's you think okay. about it, right? You don't, the customer is not thinking that, oh, it's super complicated to build this. Mm -hmm. They don't. They don't. They don't see that, right? They see exactly as you said. They see one company. I'm talking to the same company. Why do you not know? Yeah, agreed. Agreed. So, what what type of industries are you seeing adopt the technology um, now, or 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 even what are you targeting specific yeah. industry personas? So, of course, we started as customer service, right? So we see a lot of interest from customer service, uh, but. Beyond that, uh, we see a huge interest uh, from for internal facing bots, uh, mm. which is almost caught us by surprise. Uh, but a lot of companies want to improve their processes internally. And uh, I think as, as companies grow and they face more and more uh, questions from their employees, uh, they want to build something automated which can help them either with onboarding or even later on uh, with their uh, being in the company. So even you know if you want to learn what is your vacation balance, you could do that for a bot. Right? So we see that, and and beyond that we see uh, we see sales, we see marketing uh, very interested in in using the technology uh, to to enhance their experiences. Yeah. That, yeah, I, to I totally see it working in that space. What do you do around the scenario that the, the bot gets to a point that it doesn't have the answer? Um, for whatever reason, let's say a subject matter expert didn't write anything for that particular question, or the person asking the question is might, might have used a nuance of language that didn't allow it to flag against a particular um, response. How do you kind of pick up those and also uncover the patterns so that you can make sure, hey, we actually need to go and write something because five people have asked the same question and each time we've not had the correct answer because the, the supporting data is not there. Do you have any way of making sure you're capturing that so your content creators can act, go back and rewrite the missing information based on the customer demand? Yeah, and that's a, that's a very spot on question. Uh, so, so number one, we have two, I would say, ways how we try to, to tackle this. One is uh, thanks to AI, right? You basically, when you build your topic, uh, you choose uh, to write a number of example utterances that the customer would use to, to trigger this topic. Uh, but we also, you don't have to list exactly everything uh, that the customer will ask. So we use AI to uh, match the intent with that topic. So based on uh, if you write, if you, if you talk about, uh, let's say you have a topic about uh, your phones, right? And so you can just say, 
uh, phone, uh, smartphone, etc. Right. But then the customer says, "Oh, I have a problem with my cell." Right. The AI would recognize this uh, as a phone and would help you kind of align that and, and lead that to that topic. But the other point, I mean, of course, sometimes it happens that even we are not super sure what the customer meant. So we have another stage where, it, where the bot is going to ask, oh, did you mean this or did you mean that? So, so then would it update its uh, intelligence to, to if, if that phrase was used again in the future, that it knew what it meant? That's a point we are get working towards. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's something definitely it will it will do in the future. Uh, yeah, so it's it's always gonna be enhancing the as you said. Yeah, you basically in this case you would just train the bot right for 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 this case, uh, and that's something definitely we we will get to uh, in in the near future. So, how much does AI play into the Power Virtual Agents product? Yeah, uh, so we have multiple kind of areas where. We leverage AI, uh, but the kind of the, the underlying thought that we operate with, or the principle that we operate, is uh, we don't want our customers to really care that there is you know AI used. We want to make it so simple to work with that they don't even need to learn any of the concepts uh, of AI to actually use the technology. So one was just the entity or the intent recognition, right? So you can just write a bunch of utterances and it will know uh, what you're talking about. But we also have, for example, a feature which is uh, called Entity Smart Matching. And so that was the example that I talked about with the phone. So you 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 can basically define a bunch of entities in your yes. dialogue. Yes, uh, yes. And so you want to learn about what color the customer wants their car, right? In. And so you define an, in your catalog, you have, let's say, five colors, right? One of them is uh, pink, if somebody wants a pink color, right? And so if the customer goes and he said, oh, I want a magenta color car, it would know and it would recognize it as mm. a pink color, and it would automatically mm -hmm. uh, wow. match that with it. Wow, wow, wow. OK, that's impressive. Yeah. So, so, so OK. And, one of the things is this product, the Power Virtual Agents, like you know, like Power Ups, like Power Automate, where let's say the limit is reached by the citizen developer, right? They've done as much as they can, but they need to extend beyond it. Can a pro dev come along and take over and extend, let's say, using cognitive services or something like that, um, or the bot framework? Could they extend what Power Virtual Agents is doing? Absolutely. So we call this, uh, we have a philosophy that we call uh, no cliff uh, yes. kind of approach. And yeah, so we don't I, I, live... I hate the term person. I hate the term. I hate the term. Okay, <laughs> it's, been, it's, it's, been, it's been around for a while, but I know what you mean. Yes, yeah, so <laughs> it is. It, I tell you why I hate it, right? Just to digress slightly. The first time I saw it presented, it was, you know, done as a, uh, you know, a chart on a, on a PowerPoint slide, right? Which is, you know, this theoretically no cliff and it didn't run off the edge of the PowerPoint chart. There was a cliff at the end of it where they ended it before the edge of the screen. And I'm like, your, your illustration has a cliff um, <laughs> rather than, than, a, than a, you know, running off into the never, never land. But anyhow, I digress, I digress. But back to no cliffs, which is, you know, a standard um, part of, uh, of the way Microsoft thinks about the power platform and the citizen development through the pro dev experience. You're saying this is fully supported in, in uh, power virtual agents. Yeah, so we support it uh, through what, what is called uh, bot framework skills. Y yes, yes, yes. So if you have already existing bot or if you have some need uh, which cannot for some reason be fulfilled yet in Power Virtual Agents, uh, you can build a bot framework skill uh, which you can bring in to Power Virtual Agents and you can simply invoke it again from the uh, authoring experience uh, to take care of the you know topic which was unable to to be fully built by Power Virtual Agents. And I think this is like also just to, to a little bit like step back. I think this is where the power of you know 
working in Microsoft and working as one Microsoft, right, to, to deliver services really shines through because entire Power Virtual Agents, it's built on both framework. It's a, it's a bot framework implementation. And thanks to that, we can actually leverage bot framework to extend the bot uh, yeah. in a very straightforward manner. No, that's, ve that's, that's very good. Just one other thing I wanted to touch on the licensing side of things. We talked around, um, you know, $1,000 for 200. Um, what did you call them? Sessions? Do you call the them sessions? sessions? Chat sessions. Chat sessions. Yeah, yes. chat, chat sessions. Does that mean that I could create 50 uh bots you know 50 different bots and then they would all pull on those that 2000 chat sessions right there's not an individual cost per bot is there correct you can create as many bots as you as you need uh yep. for your for particular needs i would be very interested in a scenario where you need 50 bots <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. yeah i'd be interested you... in that customer can you uh, send them our way yeah totally agree right <laughs> uh, i would you know recommend using topics more in that case yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah you can do it so it's it's gonna be pulled across the bots that you create um in that and and one thing i would also like to highlight is uh which we stress kind of with the rebranding is uh you don't need any pre-existing microsoft technology basically uh to use power virtual agents uh you can purchase it uh we if you purchase power virtual agents you automatically get provisioned uh, cds environment so cds capacity so you can build a, your cds environment uh you get with rsq you get the right to use a power automate to extend the virtual agents as much as you as you like so you don't need to purchase a separate power automate license to to do that uh, so even if you you know don't use currently any any dynamics or even power platform uh, products uh, you could mm -hmm. use power virtual agents nice nice that that's very cool it's very cool tell me um you, you know, touched on omni-channel handoff. How easy it is? How easy is it if you to set up that transfer to a live agent? Uh, is it to do that? Yeah. So, so uh, I mentioned the uh, Dynamics 365 omni-channel hub integration. Uh, that one is a configuration uh, setup. So it's a bunch of steps that you need to go through to set it up. Uh, it's not as we we don't think it's. Uh, particularly complex. I mean, of course, there is some things to to create, but as a citizen developer, which is our always our kind of bar, uh, you, will, you will be able to do that. Now, you can also integrate with any other uh, life agent solutions like life person, uh, etc. Uh, but for that, you will have to write uh, some custom code or leverage uh, their experiences to kind of integrate uh, using the middleware. Uh, into there mainly for the handoff for the contextual handoff so that you also uh, you know transfer the handoffs and the customer doesn't have to repeat themselves yeah yeah can i give you a scenario and you tell me whether you think you could build it let's let's do it okay so here's my scenario i have power apps on my on my uh my my um my iphone Right, and I have a virtual agent on my website, and somebody, you know, they they want to get handed off to talk to me directly. Could I, you know, using Power Automate and Power Apps and and uh, Power Virtual Agents, could I make it that, you know, this is not an enterprise grade thing, but it would actually pop a a notification on my phone. I could jump in and just start texting them backwards and forwards through Power Apps. We could do the notification part. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we. I don't think there is a chat interface in Power Apps that we would be able to uh, leverage to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, that that would be my answer. But we can definitely do you know notification through Power Automate uh, to okay. extend that. Yeah. Well, let's just put it. Let's put a challenge out to the listeners and see who's going to be the first one to demonstrate a Power App using Power Automate through to Power Virtual Agents in it, and it being a two-way conversation. Let's see if somebody can I be really it. creative and come up with a solution. I love um, it. Yeah, let's, it, let's see. Before we get on to some quick-fire questions, is there anything else you want to add? I think you, you know, you, <laughs> you asked the right questions. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's good. But, but I mean, as I said, like, 
we the product is out there. It's yeah. publicly available. Just go to aka.ms slash try PBA and mm-hmm. check it out and let us know what you think. We all of the PMs on the product are very active either on LinkedIn, Twitter, or the communities. Excellent. Uh, so if you have any questions, just just post it on the idea. We also have a community, so post it there. Or we have an ideas forum where you can just u- upload, you know, things that you would like to see in the product. Yeah. And we monitor that daily. So excellent. So so you monitor ideas daily. They've got the the dynamics forums. Um, sorry, the the power platform forums. That there will be a channel dedicated to power virtual agents that people can you know and the community can get involved in q a in that channel is that correct yeah that's exactly yeah. fantastic okay let's get on to some quick fire questions are you ready these are random questions come out of you know all right let's do it a different world okay here we go <laughs> okay here's your first one this is a deep question what are some of your personal rules that you refuse to break okay i i will never smoke I think Uh that's my rule. Uh, Good. I will. I think this this is fundamental. Yes, you you cut me. Yeah, yeah. It's good. It's good. No, (laughs) hey, that that was a good solid answer. Um, What was the worst haircut you've ever had? Oh, so I have a funny story on that one, actually. So (laughs) when I was very little, I think like Mm -hmm. six, seven, uh, we decided with my brother, who was two years older, that we will do a haircut at home. We were like, it's not that hard. Mm-hmm. So we ha- have hidden behind a sofa and he has started cutting my hair. Mm-hmm. Uh, but my mom has interrupted us in the middle. So I ended up with just like half cut hair, which I wore for a couple of days after before I actually went to a hairdresser. <laughs> I love it. I love it. If you could complete in, compete in the Olympics, which sport would you choose? Cycling. And Cycling. I actually... so. Uh, a side story there, I did uh-huh. a lot of cycling, road cycling, when I was younger. I was in France uh, trying to become a professional cyclist. Wow. Before I went to college, I had some injury, so I had to go back to college. But my brother, he made it. He is a wow. professional cyclist, and he actually wow. did compete in the uh, Rio de Janeiro Olympic Games in cycling. Wow. That's epic. That is so cool. I'm glad I asked that uh, question. Okay, here's your next one. What show on Netflix did you binge watch embarrassingly fast? I don't know about a show, but I just watched Irishman. And okay. it's a really good movie. I would recommend it. It's with Al Pacino and uh, Robert De Niro. Nice. Awesome actors. Really good. So yeah. it's a three and a half hour movie. Wow. And I binge watched the, I, I watched the thing in, in one run. So really the good. Irishman. I'll have to check it out. Uh, would you rather not have arms or legs, and why? Oh well, uh, I think <laughs> both would be hard. <laughs> yeah, it's hard for <laughs> you, right? Because you're into cycling, which uses your legs, exactly. but you're into coding, which uses your arms. <laughs> I think I would uh, use my arms more. Okay, okay, that's good. Last last question. What's something about you that surprises people when they first hear it? Uh, that I'm from Czech Republic. Most people think I'm from Sweden or Germany. Oh, wow. Well, very close countries, right? Very close countries. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Still Europe. Michael, yeah, yeah, yeah it's still Europe. Um, is there anybody you recommend as a guest for the podcast in future? It's a good question. I would recommend uh, Omar Aftab. If you can get him, he's the he's the GPM for Power Virtual Agents. Yeah. And he could tell you even more about, you know, I think the future of the industry. He's very, he, his vision is amazing. Uh, Excellent. Excellent. I like it. Michael, it's been great to have you on the show. Before you go, if people want to kind of follow where you're blogging or social media, where can they find you? So I'm on Twitter and on LinkedIn. That's usually where I'm uh, present. Just Google my name uh, with the social network and you should you should find me there. Just, you know, shoot me a message. Tell everybody your name again, first and last. <laughs> Michael Bakoc. And the last name is spelled V-A-K-O-C. Hey, thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed that show. My name is Mark Smith, otherwise known as the NZ365 guy. Uh, I try to do these podcasts, get two podcasts out or two, uh, yeah, two shows out a week, two episodes a week. Uh, Every Tuesday I do, uh, every alternate Tuesday, I either interview a Microsoft uh, employee 
generally from the product team. And the alternate Tuesday, I interview somebody from the community, whether the business side of, of Microsoft business applications or people that are, you know, got their hands dirty in, at the coal face and, and working with the technology. Uh, the other show is on a Thursday, and it's where I interview the various MVPs in our community, talk about their journey, you know, what they're involved in their day-to-day, -day, how, the, how they became MVPs, and, and really, you know, what does the world look like from their point of view, because there's not any two MVPs are not the same, right? They're, they're quite unique, but they have some very interesting insights to the industry that we're operating in. Remember, full show notes can be found at nz365guy.com forward slash 166. I'll see you next time.